Welcome to Inside Personal Growth Podcast. Deep dive with us as we unlock the secrets to personal development, empowering you to thrive. Here, growth isn't just a goal, it's a journey. Tune in, transform, and take your life to the next level by listening to just one of our podcasts. Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Boyson, the host of Inside Personal Growth. And I have Sage Rader joining me from Tampa, Florida. And we tried to do a podcast a few weeks back. And for some reason, it was my fault. Um, although he has gremlins in his microphone, uh, the reality was is that uh, my video editor didn't like that. But Sage was uh, is an interesting man. And I'm going to basically tell my listeners a little bit about you. Uh, he is a breath artist, a biohacking pioneer, a violinist, poet, and creator of Breath Church, an online community dedicated to self-healing and neuroacrobatics, a system of breath and brain games desired to create rapid dynamic shifts in consciousness that show up in the real world and real time. Over the past two decades, uh, his creative work's been featured in W Magazine, Global Wellness Institute's 2021 trend report on breath work, the New York Times, BBC, PBS, ITV, and Cirrus XM, uh, where he was in a competition for Grand Jury Prize at the Sundance Film Festival. Um, so after recovering from a series of near fatal medical conditions and rebuilding his brain and body back from scratch more than once, Sage now has the privilege to share his secrets with super celebrities, doctors, scientists, CEOs, as well as extreme trauma and cancer and chronic patient warriors. Uh, NeuroAcro, for short, is designed to take the same secrets used by elite performers under most demanding circumstances and make them accessible to anyone, anyone with breath and brain. He said his mission is to weave breath and brain games with music and community to relieve the loneliness and pain epidemics driving the opioid epidemic. Well, good on you for that last one. Uh, certainly needed. And, you know, the the interesting thing is that um, Bruce Cryer, who introduced me to him, for many of you that already know, because Bruce has been on the show several times, um, he was the president of or CEO of HeartMath. Uh, and many of my listeners already know that. So, you know, I told the listeners just a tad bit about you just now, and obviously that's there, but there's always more underneath the hood than is always told that's under the hood. And I kind of like to let the listeners know that from you, Sage. Um, what is it that's under the hood that you haven't told us that really drives you to not only the mission you have, but the work that you're doing? Wow, that's a great uh, question. Let's start right with that, shall we? Um, what's under the hood that I haven't told you? My joy comes from a place of incredible challenge. And the more challenged I am, the less... Oh, there's the gremlin. Sorry, just, just for the listeners. I live near a military base. There's we nothing we can do. Already. That's Joe. Tom and Tina may or may not show up later, but that's Joe. I love it. So get that early. <laughs> Everybody know you know you know what you're in for. Yeah, if, uh, exactly. This episode. Me and my gremlins. So what's under the hood? My joy. And it comes from a place of incapacity. So we're supposed to have this image that's very public. And then we talk about authenticity, but then we go back and burnish and polish our mask, our persona, that aspect of self that is most rewarded by society. And chronic pain and chronic, quote unquote, illness produce weakness that dispense with that whole idea. And so I'm either authentic, I'm always this way, or very quickly, everyone's going to see it, smell it, feel it, hear it. It's going to come out. And so I want to encourage people from the beginning, if you're not crushing it, that's okay. If you're having a hard time and things are falling off or going sideways, that's okay. That is what gave me the skill set 
that has allowed me to operate in like super world. And so if you've got something that's going on in you that you don't love, that you maybe have some shame around, that you'd like to polish up before you maybe bring it out to the dance to show people how you've crushed that old habit with this new one and you can make money giving it to them, sit in that and ask yourself, what kind of lemonade can I make that the world needs? Who else is in this position right now that I can help? What's happened is because I've approached it that way, the people I've been able to help are cartoonishly successful. Orders of magnitude beyond anything I could comprehend right now in my own personal sphere. And there I am, helping them. And we'll discuss today where and how we operationalize all of this. But the first thing under the hood every morning once I dispense with, okay, with the chronic pain and issues I've got, what's it going to be today? Dispense with that first question of the day, with the first breath of the day. And then choose joy. And then no matter what comes at me, I'm able to process it as a gift with joy. Not all day, every day, all the time. But if you lead with, hey, I'm a joyful guy and you can have joy too, you're not going to get anywhere operationally. That's not, joy is not on the resume in corporate. However, joy is a requisite for the kind of performance that I lead, that I expect, and that I am constantly interacting with. And when I can remind those people who are really crushing it, what's under the hood here comes from a place of not necessarily that, I don't know, I kind of giggle a little because it's the inverse, it's the law of proving out the opposite to be true. And as an artist, I'm sorry, I'm a moderate provocateur. I believe that art should be provocative, evocative. I'm old school that way. And so I like the idea that art can trickle like water into spaces and joy and love and all this hippie stuff can be operationalized at the highest levels of human performance and existence, and then go home and make a difference with wives and husbands and children. And that's my joy. That's the motivator. That's what I don't tell a lot of people. A lot of hard lines and spaces. You'll hear me speak in military terms or things like devastatingly effective. What people don't realize is what makes you that is what I've got in spades. And that comes from a place of swapping out pain consciously, circumstances I don't want consciously for joy. That's rightfully mine. I claim it. Well, that's what your breathing techniques do. I hear another little gremlin. That was a small one. That, that was a small one. But you know, look, we just finished the Olympic Games and I'm reflecting on um, Phelps and Simone Biles, both of them having to deal with se severe depression, right? Um, and I watched Simone Biles with much anticipation in this last game and actually watched how she was breathing before everything, how she was preparing herself, knowing that she'd been through that very painful uh, challenging with depression, same way, same way with Michael Phelps. Um, you see these extreme athletes who practice day in and day out the same thing over and over and over and over again to become good or the best. Let's just put it that way, the best. How is it that you can help somebody like that because you state you've helped people like this? Doesn't matter where the performance is. Maybe they're a singer, maybe they're a dancer, maybe they're a musician, but they have to be at their best. How is it that your work helps people to become their best? Hey. By allowing them to come into contact with the felt sensation of their own excellence. I'm often able to bypass conscious thought 
and I'm able to help them find a metaphor that brings them to awareness of their own excellence. And that's where the joy comes in. Because once I can experience myself as being as good as I already am, and I can relax into greatness and excellence, there's sort of an almost giggle fit. It's like, this couldn't be that easy. This shouldn't be that easy. There's got to be something in the way. And I'm like, no, that's it. So I work with people to get rid of fear. And we could call it anxiety and depression and all of that, but really at the center of a lot of what I see in corporate and these very unique solitary islands of overachievement is a fear that continues to drive and motivate them. And that will only take us so far. Now, fear is necessary, and there's a lot of really good literature and study out there and application of the fear uh, response. But my world is about creating a felt sensation of their excellence in their system using music and metaphor and breath. It's so very quickly, we bypass all the thinking mind and we get right to feeling felt sensation in the body connected to subconscious. And I have carefully decoded the language of experience, connected it and correlated it via first principles with breath and then correlated all of that to the music, and I present a package that is very powerful, very simple, very elegant. And those people simply fold around into and relax into their greatness, their excellence, which is the sort of foundation. I keep doing this. It's like a rock at the center, and the rest of them drapes and folds beautifully around the foundation of their pre-existing innate excellence. And corporate will actually foster the fear. The companies, the entities are actually quite sick. Some of them really insanely sick and people yeah. come away with this profile of an abused spouse. And these are the incredibly high functioning institutions. And so the culture of the institution well, in one comes respect, home. back in one okay. respect, high functioning in another respect, maybe not so high functioning. Um, you know, you, as you were speaking, uh, recently an email came in from a couple of my meditation teachers, Dr. Joel and Michelle Levy, with a statement from the Dalai Lama. They send out these newsletters. And what was interesting was a comment that he made about mindfulness. And it was almost as if, and I don't know how to take this, but the, I think this is a good place for us to di take a deeper dive into it. Mindfulness from a standpoint of, are you truly mindful? Meaning he was saying there's this state of mindfulness, which is false. Making this sense that you're pretending to be mindful mm -hmm. versus this truly state. And I'm paraphrasing here without actually reading the quote. I could bring it up and read it but the true state of really diving into a mindful space. It kind of reminds me of your work. In this, here's the correlation that I have. You know, people can say, well, I go into meditation and I do breath work. Well, but do you really dive as deep as you really could dive into the breath work to get the optimum benefit from the breath work. Now we see these studios cropping up all over the place where people do breath work, come in and do the breath breath work in there. What is what is your stance? Two points. One, the comment about the Dalai Lama, uh, about mindfulness. And two, how do the core principles of your somatic breath work and how do they contribute to everyone who's listening? well-being, overall well-being. Mm. Those are two very detailed, very separate questions. Let me see if I can keep that all together. The compound question. Yeah. Uh, to, the, to the point of mindfulness and breathing, the same breath with a different thought is a different breath. Meaning as soon as I begin to think differently, 
without changing my breathing patterns. And this is where breath 1.0, I think, is woefully inadequate. As soon as I start thinking, I change the chemistry in my body so I can breathe a certain way. And I'm proving this out with all my wearables that I'm doing. I'm like, I'm less relaxed at the end of the relaxing exercise than I was when I started. Because now I'm all concerned. I'm ticking boxes. I'm performing. I'm this anticipatory reflex. Mm -hmm. And so true mindfulness actually has to bring change, in my opinion. If my practice isn't bringing progress, then I'm not practicing intelligently, and I might need or want to go back and revisit my entire practice, everything I think I know about myself, God, and the universe. And when you look at your life, I look at my life, like, wow, uh, I thought I was pretty mindful there, but the evidence, the demonstration would suggest otherwise. So I say, well, you know what? Look at your life. Look at your relationships. Look at your world. That's what you know spiritually. There's no such thing as undemonstrated spiritual knowledge. If I actually know it, it's in my life. If I say I know it and it's not in my life, how much do I really know it? So mindfulness needs to bring change. And for me, powerful, sustainable change has been achieved by awareness of my state in my breath and then a tether to something greater than myself that allows me to do an internal job and actually allow that change to happen, invite that change, be willing and spacious and full of ease about the change. But I've got to invite it. I've got to be ready for it. That's part one, I think. What's the what's the part one? And I add to. I'm not making it more complex. Yeah, no, go for but, it. But the but the work that we do, you know, look, I went to a dinner Friday night called the India Night at a Self Realization Fellowship, and I see all my friends there, you know, and as you advance through the ranks, you get a Kriya card, Kriya Yoga, right? Mm -hmm through the practicing of the techniques to actually, and this is at, at its best, breath work, right? It's all about meditation, mm -hmm. breathing in, bringing in the right breath work. And those altered states of consciousness, which you are helping people attain, some people are now, you know, I should say Stephen Kotler, this is Flow Genome Project, right? It's like, okay, he's been on here five or six times talking about that. But at its best in the corporate world, which you were just mentioning, this is where I'm going to go back to. We, we are providing a service to an overall larger community and our talents to hopefully merge together to make something wonderful happen as a result. I don't care if it's a law firm or it's a landscaping company. It doesn't matter what it is. We're coming together as a team. Now, not everybody else on this team has the same perspective, mm -hmm. viewpoint, right? So in your work, specifically with organizations, how do you address and alleviate the stress-related issues amongst employees? Because every employee on a scale of 1 to 10 has at a different stress level. Okay. Uh, same may, may be at 15. Okay. Some may be at 2. Okay. But it's also, and you know this, because of their ability to utilize your techniques and others, I won't just say somatic breathing, but others as well, to get to an altered state to be able to move forward in that environment, to work in that environment, to be productive in that environment, to be able to communicate in that environment, to be honest and trustworthy and open and all the things that people want, because that's the highest level of performance we can give. Yeah. So 100%. tell me, tell me when you go into work for a 
uh, law firm that many of them are, whew, man, high stress. Talk about high stress organizations. <laughs> sure. About as high stress as they come, right? <laughs> and that's my favorite. I like high stakes. I like it when people are moving the GDP. Yeah. And I enjoy that level of requirement on the system because that actually is what I learned in my own personal healing. I mean, that's what qualified me. So you put it in an environment now. Not everybody wants it. Not everybody even thinks that it works. You find the people who are first adopters, early adopters, first followers, and you begin to work there and you make a tiny clean spot. In some of these places I've been going back year after year after year. And so I'm tracking trends. I'm tracking society. Society is changing and requiring these large institutions to change. So whether they want to individually or not, the mandate is coming from on top and I get to go in and bump up against every piece of resistance to policy that there is. But because everybody's thinking and breathing, all of them, like every single human in that organization, there's a single common first principle that everyone can relate to. And what they discovered with Navy SEALs in particular is you put them in the same room at the same time for the same reason and getting breathing in the same way, release them out into the wild. You'd let one loose, the leader turns his head and the rest of them turn their head. They begin to share the same thoughts. So my work is actually quite easy because everyone's breathing. And if they're skeptical, it takes me about three minutes to illustrate in the breath what I'm talking about. And they're like, oh, okay. So I keep it operational. Nobody has to go lay down. Nobody's doing breath work. I had to get the words breath work out of what I do because of the association. We've got to lay down, burn Palo Santo. I'm not disrespecting thousands of years of tradition and history. I'm simply saying in the places I go, in the environments that I find myself, people are not laying down. There are no yoga mats and nobody's asking for breath work. Nobody's asking for spiritual enlightenment. <laughs> They've been told there's a program offered to the most elite of them. And if they would like it, it's got these famous people attached and this proof of concept and this general idea. And then I design or outline a program and then we get takers. And so everyone who wants to work with me is working with me. I always get someone who's interested. I don't get often people who are voluntold, which is kind of cool because I get those people and then culture changes because the first thing that happens is they take it home. Tell me one other thing from work that they take it home that makes their life infinitely better overnight. The kids, spouse, dog, the whole enchilada becomes far more interesting, fun, enjoyable, manageable, very quickly, like after the first or second session. These are corporate one-on-ones. So it's not hard work. It's enjoyable work. It's easy. If I had more of me and more opportunity, I would be making far more impact because the results are like shocking. Every time I'm surprised that I'm surprised, but I'm surprised. What if you could... Because I think people that are listening are like, okay, so what does this guy do, right? Right. Um, and one of the things I know is I referred you a young lady and you made audio tapes for her and she had huge success. And I would like to know what is a success story or case study where neuroacrobatics significantly improved the well-being of the workforce? Now, I, I understand that you are improving the well-being of the workforce. Are you doing it in group work? Are you doing it in individual work? Are you making these tapes for everybody that's there where you custom design them and give them to everybody so they can listen to them when you're not there? So what does that look like? What does that feel like? Yes. So um, I use music. I use metaphor. And I use breath. And anyone can use those words and say that's what they do. 
the demonstration of it is where it gets really interesting and fun and the roots of where I pulled it all together and tied it up. So, ask me the question one more time, please. Really, what is it that you do and what is the success story that you have about what you've done and the evidence that might support it? Because there's that, right. there's obviously successful people and they'll say, well, what's the scientific scientific research or evidence that supports what it is you do? And I know the NIH has done all kinds of study on meditation, mindfulness. We could cite zillions of things. Um, I wrote a book with, uh, with a gentleman called Wisdom, Wellness, and Redefining Work, Thriving in a World of Ever-Increasing Complexity. And we put in all kinds of NIH studies, right? Um, we actually asked people to take breather breaks and focus phrases. This has gone way back, right? This is like, this is, and this is before anyone was accepting. Well, the bottom line is the book was a dismal failure. Uh, because nobody really wanted to do breather breaks and focus phrases, right. and we were trying to do it. And right. so now here comes this new thing, neuroacrobatics. Right. It was pretty close to it. Um, and the guy's name was John Selby, and you actually might know John, very famous in the field that we wrote this book together. But my question is, as time has evolved, right. I've noticed a greater level of acceptance and rise in willingness to try new things. Whereas when we first started it, the doors were just kind of shut. It was like, Boop, sorry, you're not bringing this into our company. We're not ready for that right. right now. <laughs> so the science behind it comes from the soft sciences, psychophysiology. And then there's a huge amount of hard science that's emerging. I'm working with a group of people now that are working with the government. So as soon as something gets declassified, I'm making it into art like that. So the person you sent me will start there, the tracks I make, because all the tracks I make are for everybody. When I do corporate, and I'll just talk about stomping the landing there, I'll give you one case study. I go in, I breathe all the new people. I breathe all the administrative staff. I breathe the support staff. I breathe all the way up to the C-suite. So I get a real picture on what's going on in the company. Then I talk to people who are in well-being and HR, and I find pain and pressure points. I find desired outcomes and goals, and I will craft the entire art, metaphor, and music experience to do exactly that. Why and how am I successful where other people claim and don't have results? Great question. So, psychophysiology says the way you think while you breathe is the most important thing. That's a core principle. Breath is a metaphor. That's a core principle. Master metaphor for life. The way you breathe, the way you do everything else. You read the breath. I teach everybody. It's blockchain. You can read opposing counsel in their breath. You can make friends with someone in their breath. It's all dual-use technology. You can build a relationship. You can wreck a relationship. Do it all with the way you think and breathe in the room, and you will own the room is the promise. And they're like, I is it a, is Is it about observing the breath, or is it about... As old Tony Robbins used to say, mirroring and matching. Uh, well, of course, mirroring and matching is hugely helpful. But where do you mirror and match first? The most subliminally important part of the exchange is in the breath. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a neuro makeover party, which I've just started doing, I created it for Worth Avenue Yachts, a global yachting partner that I'm working with. And I did my first one on land. I had people breathing with each other they left best friends in their breath with a bunch of complete strangers. The artist was weeping. People had written down cards of what her art meant to them. They were breathing while she described it. They were breathing while I let them loose and played my violin to go experience the art. Then they came back. People were hugging and exchanging numbers, total strangers. So you take that kind of neuro makeover Tupperware party for the mind you insert that into corporate where you promise them a desired outcome and you better be able to deliver it. But then very quickly, because I've decoded the language of existence, of experience, of the subconscious, everybody has a master metaphor. I watch how they breathe. I notice the blips. As soon as there's a blip, I ask them about it. We bring it up. I get them talking. Pretty soon they've given me their own metaphor and their own words to solve their own problem. And they've done it in their language. And all I do is give that back to them very, very quickly. I'm being reductive, obviously, but 
Psychophysiology says that the way I'm thinking gets wired is going to experience cells are intelligent. Like the whole body is an intelligent learning system. So I'm working on that premise on the entire being, the entire cellular structure and infrastructure at once without claiming it or saying it. And then I'm directing it towards exactly who or what they want to feel like when they're done that will correlate to the state that they need to be in to actually be that because learning is state dependent. So breath anchors and changes state like nothing else. Combine that with the right words at the right time and the right music, sound drives sensation. And I started with the most famous pop star in the world, arguably at the time, first private client. So I've had to be sure that this could work from the very beginning. As you mess up once at that level, you're done. And so I have had to prove it out of myself first, my closest friends and colleagues, go get the smartest men and women on the planet to give me the science to reverse engineer what I actually created. And now I'm with them and they're like, hey, could you do that? So the person you sent me, the science people are thrilled that within three days of the latest science that the public could hear about, I had created a track that I gave to a private client. So to get, out, get outside of corporate now, no groups, no one-on-ones in a corporate setting. I also take, and my real joy is private clients for one to three months, deep dive, deep dive. And all these principles get to know their breath, get to know everything about themselves and their breath, how to be that as they travel the world and just absolutely stomp the landing on every goal they have and putting in music with the right metaphor at the right time, sometimes working out, sometimes chilling. And we now know that maximal is not optimal. Intentional suboptimization is my game. And that music and that original thing given back to them comes at a premium price, which is worth it. And they come to my studio and we record. I treat them like an artist. And I can do things when I treat people who don't think of themselves as brilliant world-class artists like a brilliant world-class artist. And suddenly the work takes over and does them. And so that's what I love is composing original music right here into this sound bed. And then people are able to anchor in their ideas with their sounds and their felt sense, walk home, and every time they breathe and listen to that track, the, thing, the whole thing, the state is anchored in. So whether it's pre-game pre -game for a big presentation or just building in baseline all day, every day, I create the tracks in their words with their metaphors and their affirmations and their beats that they want. And I think I'm about to actually launch something with her to the world because it was so powerful. We should talk about that. She wants to collaborate around creating these types of affirmations for corporate culture that are relatable, that you can work out to or dance to or mm -hmm. find moments of peace and respite to. Yeah, and so no, you are I, instrumental. I would agree that, you know, and the reason is it at a point in time when someone hires you, hires anybody to help them get through a, a stuck spot, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm stuck. I need help. Um, look, all my life, that's that's what I've done, is help people get unstuck. The question is, how long do they remember what it is that I did and what did you leave them with so that that became part of their DNA? That was part of it. Now, look, breathing is a natural human thing we do all day long. Do we recognize it? No. Do we recognize our heartbeat? Hardly ever, right? It's like it's we take all of that physiology that you're talking about for granted. Mm -hmm. So to actually pay attention to the breath and work with it as a tool to, our, to improve our level of relaxation, to get us more focus, to help us become more creative. I think most of my listeners know it exists, right? Uh, they just don't know how to remember how to use it, right? So the tool you're talking about using to have these 
audio tapes to do that, I think, and there have been many people that have done it. As you know, Bruce worked with Gary Malkin, and they created a whole series that, that they did, which goes way back for me, back to the time when I was using that with cancer patients, right? So I get that this is something we have to remember. So my question is this, after all of this dialogue, how do you help people remember? And they're already breathing anyway. It's almost like they forget, though. <laughs> mm. And so that's where we start. And if I could give the audience one thing, I would just say begin to notice when you're holding your breath. Begin to notice, start the whole relationship with your breath by noticing when you're not breathing. When are you absent the breath? And ask yourself, to whom or what? Am I giving the power of life and death? Because the difference between dead and not dead is breath. Begin to notice. And breath will anchor itself in. So I just got a text from a client that something happened and a dog slipped and broke a leg. And while that was happening, they were very, very present. They were able to say, you know what? I never thought I would be able to be this in the breath, but this is just what happened. And so it anchors itself in. And I would just say, remember that when you're not breathing, ask yourself why. Ask yourself what's going on. Begin to tag that thought and notice. And just notice every time you're holding your breath. Because there are a lot of people out there who will tell you you need them. I'm going to I'm going to say no. You don't need me. You're already breathing. Your body knows how to breathe in a way that's optimal, not maximal, and the more you get out there and begin to intervene without real knowledge, it's dangerous. I am not a fan of breathwork 1.0. To be clear, we have got to evolve the genre so that people don't have to separate themselves from the stimulus that's wrecking their whatever to recover from the stimulus that's wrecking their whatever. We I get understand. to yeah. integrate. And that's the anchoring. You're never asking someone to do something out of context. All of their well-being and breath is brought into the context of now, of what's happening, of how I'm feeling and how I want or need to feel to accomplish a different level of a consciousness and execution in the 3D. Well, you're... You're definitely on the cutting edge of this, right? If there's any one person that is, it's you. So my question to kind of sum up this podcast interview would be this. One, uh, I heard you what you said about Breath 101, and I get it. I know exactly what you're talking about. I think my listeners do too. Um, whether it's dangerous or not, there's a lot of it going on, right? It's it's just out there. Just my what's well, yeah. What is the future look like? Because I get exposed to all kinds of doctors that are advocating certain things, from you know uh, Peter Atia to uh, Doctor Simon to all these various people that are working in longevity space. They're looking at working in the breath space. You're seeing all of this now become more at the forefront than it ever has been before, which is great. There's also a lot of confusion for my listeners. I would say there's a lot of like trepidation to go down this road or that road, or I heard what this guy said or that guy said. And, you know, not putting anything against it. I've been podcasting for 17 years. When I started, there was hardly anybody. Now there's, you know, the half a million podcasters, right? So you can tune in any day and hear anything you want anywhere, wherever you want to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, I always like to bring what I hope is the best. So I'm going to ask you this question. What, based on the current evidence you have, scientific back scientific studies, and the situation with relation to our physiology, you know, what is happening and where do you see this going? And how can this be used most effectively, both personally and professionally? That's a great question. The future is decidedly capnography. If we can see what is happening to our breathing behavior in terms of our real-time CO2, we can correlate breathing 
as a phase one of respiration. And we can actually optimize respiration and physiology with our breathing, with a full understanding that breathing is just the beginning of that process. When I'm done, there's a gas exchange and then that goes. So you take all the science away. I'm just making art based on science. So you don't need to know the science, but you can participate in something that's joyful and fun and easy. I would ask people to remember that when I say it's dangerous, I mean that the unconsidered life is not worth living. The unconsidered breath is dangerous in as much as we can begin to think and breathe in a way that serves our psychology, but isn't actually helping our body. Everyone go please look up Dr. Peter Litchfield and the School of Behavioral Health Sciences, the Professional School of Behavioral Health Sciences and Dr. Peter Litchfield. He is pioneering this field after 40-something years, maybe 50-something years of psychology and bridging psychology and physiology and psychophysiology. I've learned from him and a bunch of the first-generation OG mind people, mind guys and gals, that literally physiology has its own, is psychological. It's fundamentally intelligent. And so I'm working with respiratory intelligence. Every one of you has it. If you're feeling dysregulated, knowing how you're breathing before you intervene is vitally important. So just be careful before you go grab an app or try a thing and you don't actually know what's going on in your body because it might actually not be helping. And so having a feedback loop with your own breath and allowing a relationship to develop before you jump in and hear what someone else said, try a trend. A lot of people I know go to those breathwork classes, have experiences they can't integrate, and they're just left sort of out there. So I would say be your own remote control. Have your own gauge. Know what you're doing in your breath. Notice how you're breathing on your own. Begin to breathe in a way that actually, I would say, assigns a metaphor to your body that feels good. And if you're able to breathe gently in and out your nose, tip of the nose to the bridge of the nose, nose in, nose out, five seconds in, five seconds out, or four seconds in, six seconds out, I would say, say start there. Go with very simple, very easy things and notice how you feel before you jump in and decide that you're going to intervene, like taking a bunch of supplements without blood work. We, we don't know. Why would I go to the grocery store, pull every supplement off the shelf, and just try a different one every day for a week? <laughs> That's what's yeah. happening with breath right now. It's like everybody's getting an Adderall pill. It's like, hey, everybody, take this Adderall. It'll do the same thing to each of you, and it'll have this spiritual result. And if you don't have it now, keep doing it. You'll get it later. And I'm like, ooh. Anything else that was being sold like that would have a serious ethical complaint board. And we do not have a reasonable ethical complaint board that's enforcing. So every one of the listeners gets to breathe on their own. Notice where it feels stuck. Notice if it hurts. Notice if it's tight. Where is it tight? How's it feeling? And start there. Just start there. One minute a day. Before we go get crazy with everything else i i think you give sage advice sage um <laughs> no pun intended but i think all my listeners go to neuro acrobatics it's n-e-u-r-o a i'm making it right i want to spell it a-c-r-o b-a-t-i-c-s dot com and there you're going to find courses you can shop you can learn more about what it is that sage does he actually even has a blog that he writes. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of information at the website. I was actually just going through your website again. Uh, there are lots of testimonials, which is a great place to go if you want to find out about, about his work. Um, so I would say that's probably the best place to go. Is there any place else you, you would send them? It's funny. I just got on LinkedIn. I haven't needed to be on LinkedIn for ever. And I just did this thing with Worth Avenue, so I got on LinkedIn. They can go find me there. Okay. I actually got a really nice there. reference there. I've never actually had a LinkedIn or anything. I like to operate quietly behind the scenes. But I'm on LinkedIn. Come say hi. And I'll be starting to create new content and put it there. 
Well, you've also got available the seven day mental law challenge. So you can sign up for that. Uh, he is on insight timer. I mean, if my listeners know that, or at least you're using insight timer. Is that right? Is that what you're advocating? Yeah, I've actually got some content on insight timer as well. I figured you, I figured you did. Yes. And it, it is it the, uh, concentrate drink the Kool-Aid water's edge. Are those the that's, ones? That's the one. Yeah. Okay. Some of it's just music for breath and meditation. Some of it is, is actually like, I call them guided medications. Guided, guided medications. I like that. So go to the website. They're eager to learn more about Sage. Uh, Sage, it's been an honor having you on. You obviously have brought a whole new level of how people need to look at, uh, you know, uh, neuroacrobatics and if you want to, I, I have Dr. Kennedy coming back on, on NPN, which is Neuroplasticians Group um, that is from Switzerland. And actually, we're doing another podcast here, and one just broke today, believe it or not. Uh, and I think that as we've looked at it and studied the science of our brain and how it works, the effects that the breath has on our actual neuro network networks is phenomenal right mm -hmm. um and it couldn't be any better to use the two in conjunction to progress your personal and professional growth mm -hmm. i mean for everybody out there listening this is the greatest way to do it however you want to look at growth your journey uh your curiosity your openness to being uh finding new things and to explore this is a great way to get there. So thank you for being on. Thanks for sharing your wisdom with us. And do reach out to him. You have, he has a contact us button. Uh, he does answer his his emails or contact us. So I do take advantage of that. If you want to increase your awareness, achieve peak performance, and or unlock some extra energy that you think you might not have, but you really do, uh, go check him out. Namaste. Thank you, Greg. Namaste. Thank you for listening to this podcast on Inside Personal Growth. We appreciate your support. And for more information about new podcasts, please go to InsidePersonalGrowth.com or any of your favorite channels to listen to our podcast. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.